Okay, so what we're going to cover tonight is the application progress process, sorry, and the program requirements, some details on uh, majoring in library science. Then we're going to take a quick look at uh, the school librarianship program, uh, then look at the information science major, uh, some of our non-degree certificate programs and some additional information about YUNT. Uh, and then we will ask you uh, to submit questions. Now, if there's something that's just a burning issue for you uh, that's on the page that we are speaking to, you can uh, submit your question in the chat and one of our moderators will uh, catch that for us, okay? So to begin with, we have Kaylee. So let me start off by introducing myself. My name is Kaylee Barnhart and I am the Graduate Admissions Officer for our master's program. So it's information science, library science and data science. Uh, I'm gonna give you just kind of a little overview of what it looks like to apply to our program. You can see at the top that we do not require a GRE. That's uh, some importance to a lot of people. And uh, our program or our application rather process is broken down into two different parts. The first part is going to be your graduate school application. What that is basically is the first part where UNT just kind of verifies that you are a person, that you have a valid uh, degree from an accredited university, they're going to verify your transcripts, and also if you are an international applicant, they're going to verify your English language proficiency, which is your TOEFL, your IELTS, your Duolingo, all of those kind of things. They're going to verify all of that and put that in the system. That is your Apply Texas and your transcripts, all of that, and also your $75 fee. Then we go into the department application. That is submitted to us, to me, to the department. If you can think about your graduate school application as your application to UNT as a whole, but then think about your department application as just drilling down a little further and getting more specific, and this is your application to the department. So this is where we're going to get a little bit more specific about our program, about your qualifications for the program. That's kind of a good way to think about it. Uh, your department application consists of four parts, and that is going to be your department application form. It's a web application, very simple uh, web form that's going to just basically be, you know, your name, your address, your email. A lot of the stuff you might have already filled out on your Apply Texas, but one very, very important component to that web application is you're going to determine or you're going to select which program of study or concentration that you want to do. That is how we know kind of what, where to put you, where, where, what your faculty advisor is, uh, and kind of just those things, just which information is pertinent to you based on if you want to major in, or if you want to select health informatics, if you want to select information systems or school librarian uh, certification with the master's program. It's just gonna help us kind of figure that out. You do have the option to pick the general program for both information science and library science. So if you're not sure yet, that's okay. You can apply to the general program and then you can still determine later if you want to specialize in a certain concentration uh, further down the line. You'll discuss it with your advisor. Maybe you figure out that you have a proclivity for one thing. And, and then you can also, you can get back, you can get on that track for that program of study or concentration. The second thing is going to be your statement of purpose. Your statement of purpose can be attached to your department application. There's a place for you to attach it. Uh, the statement of purpose is just basically your elevator pitch. It's about yourself. Uh, you just want to basically tell us why you're applying to the program, what qualifications you have, what are your goals for getting this degree, uh, do you have experience, what's your inspiration behind your application or, or wanting to join our program. What, it's going to be about 300 to 500 words, so it is, it is a short a uh, short kind of little statement about yourself, but you know, you just condense down why you wanna be a part of this program and why you would make an excellent candidate for this program. 
then we do require a resume. Um, it's just uh, basically how it sounds in your resume, you know, include any uh, work experience that you have in the field. Uh, if, and also, you know, your education, basically what a resume is, probably don't need to explain that to you. That can also be attached to your department application form. Then we have our two letters of recommendation. So those can be submitted by, you know, your employer, your previous professors, uh, colleagues that you have, uh, you know, if you volunteer at a library and the librarian wants to write a recommendation, those are all great things. The only thing I say is I, I don't need to see a recommendation from your mom, your dad, your sister, your uncle, anybody who is a familial relation that maybe that bias is gonna come into play, uh, that is not appropriate for a letter of recommendation. We do have two ways of submitting those letters of recommendation. We do have a hand to e-form, then that can be sometimes a little bit easier to ask from people because I know sometimes it can be awkward to ask for a letter of recommendation. You just send the, your reference, the link to this e-form and they're gonna, it's a rating scale. They're gonna type in just like uh, some things about you, but what's helpful about that, it is a preset form. So they just answer questions rather than having to maybe come up with a, a whole formal letter. We do still accept the formal letters. Uh, you can email them to ci-admissions at unt.edu. And typically I do like to see them come from the actual reference. So the reference should email them to us. But if you have them in your possession and attachments, you can email them in um, on your references behalf. I will accept that. Uh, and those are kind of the components to your department application form. I like to ask that people do submit both as closely together as possible because uh, without your grad school application, we can't process your department application. Without your department application, we can't process your graduate school application. So both components are needed to process your application as quickly as possible. Uh, so it is good to just I prefer you submit them both at the same time. If that's not feasible, just try to get it as closely together as possible. But it is important to remember those two different components, your graduate school application and then your department application. Uh, like I said, one doesn't work without the other. Uh, and then we can get into the qualifications for the program. Uh, we do ask that, or we do require a GPA of 3.0 or higher for your overall GPA or your last 60 hours. Uh, sometimes the last 60 hours can be significantly higher than your cumulative GPA because people grow, they mature, they, they figure out what they wanna do near the end of their degree. You know, that happens a lot. Uh, we do, or if you wanna apply with a graduate degree, a previous graduate degree, it's a 3.5 or higher. Now I kind of want to talk about something that two different things that I am kind of uh, pretty passionate about. So we do have some options if you do not meet the hard criteria for admission. Uh, and that is just because, you know, education uh, is not always a linear thing. You know, we have life happens and, and we take segues and we take different paths and, you know, Sometimes we come back around 10, 20 years later and we want to continue our education. And I understand that. And, you know, in that 10, 20 years, five years, whichever, we mature, we grow, maybe we get into the field and that's what inspires us and, and we excel at that. But our undergraduate GPA from 20 years ago is, is lower than it probably would be if we completed our degree today. So we do have two options if you don't meet uh, the hard the 3.0 requirement for admission. The first one is going to be called is conditional admission. Uh, if you have a GPO undergraduate, or I'm sorry, your overall or last 60 hours GPA, uh, if it ranges from 2.9 to 2.99, you can be conditionally admitted to the program. And the condition is usually that you have to maintain A's and B's on the first 12 hours of graduate coursework. You're gonna to wanna to do that anyway, because we, you know, you really do wanna keep A's and B's in, in most of your graduate coursework. Uh, so honestly, that condition really kind of should apply to everyone, but it, this is a, a condition on you remaining in graduate status. Uh, then the second thing we offer is undergraduate leveling. 
If your GPA is in the range of 2.6 to 2.89, we can offer you what is called undergraduate leveling. And basically what that is, is what that would look like is you would get a denial decision on your application. So you'd receive a denial letter, but when you receive your denial letter in the mail, uh, you will see that there is an offer of undergraduate leveling. And what you would do is you would reach out to me. You can email me at Kaylee, C-A-L-E-Y dot Barnhart, B-A-R-N-H-A-R-T at UNT.edu. And you would just say, Kaylee, I was offered undergraduate leveling and I'd like to do that. In which case I would connect you with one of our undergraduate, uh, our undergraduate uh, advisors, and they would help you figure out which four courses that you would take in our college at the undergraduate level. If you maintain A's and B's in those 12 hours of undergraduate coursework, you can request, uh, you can then request admission to the program and you can be offered admission to the program contingent on the successful completion of undergraduate leveling. I have received a couple questions about whether or not, if you are taking leveling courses, will they apply to your graduate degree? Well, they won't because they're undergraduate courses. These, these would be taken outside of your, your graduate degree. But what is really excellent about this program and one of the reasons why I'm just so passionate about it is it is a great way for someone who has been out of school for a decade and they want to be reintroduced to what education looks like today because it has changed tremendously in the past 10 years. And, uh, you know, most things are online. So it'll help you to reacclimate to kind of what education looks like today. And it's going to also be in our program. So it's going to help you kind of get a uh, experience with our department, experience with our instructors. And honestly, it, it really is just a great way for someone who maybe did not have the best undergraduate GPA to gain access to our program, because not only is it showing us, you know, you're capable and you can do it, but it's also helping you to, like I said, probably five times already, reacclimate to what education looks like today. Um, and yeah, so that is, uh, that is really what our program looks like. Uh, application-wise and what our admission looks like. Now we do, if you are denied, we do build appeals based on people's uh, experience, uh, you know, excellent letters of recommendation, things like that. We do consider the holistic person, the holistic application. So if you don't meet this hard uh, criteria that you're seeing, but but you have uh, experience, you've been working in a library for 10 years, you know, you have excellent recommendations from your your librarian, uh, your principal, you you should still apply because it, it isn't, it, it, there is consideration for the whole person here and not just the numbers. And that is very important to me. That's very important to our administration that we consider the whole person. Because uh, GPA is is not everything. GPA is not all. It does not indicate your whole journey. Uh, but that's pretty much what our program looks like when you apply to it, and what admission looks like. So, thank you. Thanks, Kaylee. Um, and you did say you'd be uh, available at the end for questions. Yes, I will figure out. Okay. And let's see if we can get this to go to the next. Um, so let's talk about the degree requirements. First of all, we have 36 hours of coursework and nine hours of those, that's three courses, are considered core to the degree and everyone, regardless of concentration, is required to take those three courses. So they provide the foundation in um, information science, library and information science, and then you have your uh, concentration. So you're going to be able to look at guided electives depending on the concentration, so which ones um, you have to choose from, and then you have um, an additional set of electives that you can uh, choose. Everybody uh, must take a practicum. Now, 
There are waivers for practicum depending on your current employment uh, situation. So for example, if you are working as um, a public librarian, for example, and uh, you have a number of uh, years of experience, you can apply for a waiver. Uh, the one area that does not allow a, pr a practicum waiver is school librarianship. All school librarians must enroll in and take uh, a practicum, and I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Also for everyone, we have um, a capstone experience that is uh, required. And this is something that you can't wave your way out of. You will be relieved to know that uh, we have introduced an e-portfolio. So rather than um, take an exam at the end of your coursework and the capstone end of program exam uh, for those people who began our program prior to 2019 means that they're spending a week writing uh, exam questions. And instead, you'll be building an e-portfolio that you develop throughout your degree and there are points along that uh, process where your e-portfolio is reviewed. So you never reach the end without understanding uh, the condition that you're in, in terms of passing that e-portfolio. And then it's finalized in the last semester. So in terms of concentrations, we have a general program or uh, you can specialize. And when you specialize, you are making a choice uh, under information science or under um, in the library science. So I'll be looking at the library science first. And that involves uh, a variety of choices, as you can see. We do have concentrations in archival studies and imaging technology, which is a really interesting um, area. We also offer um, a certificate in that area. So if you wanted to do that in addition to your degree, that would work out. Um, information organization. So think of uh, catalogers. This is a great area and Dr. Zavalina, who will be uh, speaking with you about the information science concentration is one of the professors uh, that teaches uh, information organization coursework. Knowledge management is coming soon. We're just on the cusp of being able to uh, offer that. Um, Dr. Hawanda is the contact for that if you wanted to uh, ask him um, more about knowledge management. Then we have a concentration in music librarianship. And typically with music librarianship, you are looking at uh, not just being able to handle the reference side, but also being able to handle the, the data and metadata side. Um, youth librarianship as well. And those positions are uh, found most often in public libraries. And then finally, we do have uh, a concentration in law librarianship that is uh, temporarily uh, suspended because our dear professor passed away suddenly. So we are not accepting students at the moment, but we will be uh, very soon. Okay, and then, uh, Finally, school uh, library certification. And uh, we do have a very specific set of uh, criteria for certification in Texas. You must have two years of early childhood to 12th grade teaching, and this can be in a public or an accredited private school. And the record um, for teaching must be submitted before you apply for certification. It is possible to start the uh, program 
without having completed your two years of teaching, but you can't apply for certification until you have completed both the program and the two years of teaching. So two years of teaching, a completed master's degree. And what that means is that if you already hold a master's degree, you might choose just to take the school library certification uh, courses. And that's, that's fine, that's of course your choice. If you don't already hold a master's degree, then you would be applying for the master's degree program as well as the school library certification program. We do recommend that even if you already hold a master's degree, which can be uh, in pretty much any uh, subject area, that you do consider the master's degree in either library science or information science, because as you are earning school library certification, if you are also earning this master's degree in library or information science, you are preparing yourself for other positions um, in our profession. So for example, it's not unusual for school librarians to think of uh, a public library uh, job in their future. So because so many um, school librarians do move in that direction, you might think, well, if you're a youth librarian, you can move in the other direction into school librarianship, and that's not the case. So because of these specific requirements for school librarians. So just think about that when you're making that choice uh, about the package of certification courses only or the full master's degree. You can choose either information science or library science as a school librarian applicant. And typically students are making that choice based on their understanding of um, the job market. So there are a lot of uh, school districts who like to think of their library situations as very technology uh, based. So you might want to choose information science. You're all gonna get exactly the same education. It really is an entry on the, on the transcript, but it is something to think about. Then of course you must pass the certification exam. And we offer coaching for that exam. Um, in your last semester. So we want to make sure that you're very well prepared. And then of course, completion of our uh, 24 hours of specific school library courses. And these are all directly related to school libraries. So it's collection development in school libraries, uh, children's literature, cataloging, yes, in school libraries. So all very specific to that situation. Practicum cannot be waived, and that's because uh, it is a state requirement for one thing, but we also have a practicum that um, we have found serves our students really well. You begin your practicum with your very first course, and you acquire a mentor who is going to help guide you throughout your coursework. So while we're providing the theoretical side, your mentor is guiding you through the practical side. And so of course your mentor will be a practicing school librarian. We do have a database of uh, available mentors for you to access, but throughout your coursework, as you, you know, explore each uh, area and dimension of school libraries, that uh, mentor is going to be completing what we call a proficiencies checklist plus you know logging the number of hours don't worry about the fact that uh in the last year we have had this incredible uh experience with covid zoom conversations um observations all of these things have been handled through this uh technology. So we've been very fortunate uh, with that. And then in your last semester, you actually register for the formal 
uh, practicum course so that it uh, is stated on your transcript. And you also turn in all of this completed um, documentation and get the coaching for the exam. Now, if you are not in the state of Texas, uh, our program satisfies the requirements uh, for other states. And we have had uh, a, a fairly uh, solid number of students who have entered our program from all over uh, the US as well as abroad. So uh, it isn't necessary that you be uh, a resident of Texas. Okay, I'll turn it over to Dr. Zavalina. Hi everyone, I'm Oksana Zavalina. I'm Associate Professor at the Department of Information. I also am a faculty advisor for the general program of studies. And uh, after I talk about concentrations, I will uh, cover the general program of studies as well. Uh, so uh, the links I have already posted while um, Dr. Schultz Jones was talking, I posted the links in the chat. So if you want to see the requirements for school librarian certification on the department's website, they are there. There are also links for the concentrations, both in library science program that Dr. Shul Jones has covered, uh, because we have links in the slides, but of course we cannot follow these links during the presentation. You can um, follow these links from the chat. And there is a link in the chat that I posted for information science uh, program uh, concentrations. But here is uh, in a nutshell, there are several of them, five, archival studies and imaging technology. This is uh, our fastest growing uh, concentration. We have a lot of students joining it and we are currently looking to expand our faculty to hire some faculty in this area additional to, to help support all of, the, all of the courses and students in this area. We do have a health informatics, which is um, um, our program in health informatics is ranked uh, by US News and uh, World Report uh, with um, rating number six in the country. So it's a well-known program. We have information organization and that's anything having to do with uh, uh, cataloging, classification, metadata, link data, semantic web and things like that. We have information systems concentration as well, and that has to do information with different kinds of information technologies. It did include knowledge management as well, uh, information systems concentration until recently, because now we are adding a new specialized concentration just focusing on knowledge management. Uh, and that's coming soon. Uh, we don't have a link uh, on our website. There is no description of this program yet. But if you are interested in pursuing the knowledge management concentration, uh, Dr. Suleiman Havamde, who is responsible for it, uh, told us to give you a, a contact information so that you can reach out directly to him and he would be happy to answer any questions you have about that concentration. Dr. Zavalina, I think you're muted now. Oops, I accidentally muted myself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what if uh, you were like me when, when I was uh, applying for a master's program? I had no clue what uh, track I would like to select or what concentration. Uh, and that's actually uh, most of our students when they start in the program do not necessarily know if they want to pursue any of the concentrations. Maybe they don't know which one, maybe they want to be more generalist. They want a little bit of everything. Then uh, a general program of study is what you need. And that's actually, I wouldn't say is the largest program we have. The school library librarianship pro program is larger than that. But from our master's uh, program, the, the largest cohort of students we have so far is in the general program of study. Uh, 
it is a much more flexible degree plan than for any of the concentration programs because it's basically uh, beyond the core. Well, there are electives, there are guided electives, but uh, there's a, a lot to select from. So student uh, is the person who makes this decision in consultations with advisors, of course, if they need help selecting the courses. And that allows to kind of berry picking to, to, to pick the most interesting courses for the student and to build the most uh, exciting uh, portfolio or whatever um, is of interest to the student. And uh, if later on you decide you, uh, you develop an interest in some specific area and you decide, oh, I want to do archival management or I want to do health informatics or anything like that, then you can transfer to a concentration program later after the first semester or even the second semester, because in the first semester, full-time students usually take the core, and the core is the same for everyone in the program. Or you can just graduate from, from the general program of study. It's, there is no pressure to select a concentration if you don't want to. So we have a uh, um, outline of uh, general requirements for the general program of study separately for information science and for the library science. The core is the same everywhere, the guided elective list and the list of uh, um, just electives from general areas is going to vary for these two programs. But there is overlap. And as I said, it is flexible. So the next, I think, is the credit academic certificates. These are listed on our website on this page. I have posted it to the chat. And um, they can be uh, received in combination with a master's degree, uh, graduate academic certificates. Uh, the ones that we offer currently are the advanced management in libraries and information agencies, if you want to focus more on uh, management related courses. There is one course that we advise all of our students to take anyways, this is an introduction to management of libraries and information centers, but there's many more than that available in our uh, offerings of courses. So if you are interested in management and advanced management in libraries and information agencies is probably a good choice for you. But then we also have archival management one, the digital content management, digital curation and data management, focusing specifically on data curation. There's four courses, rural library management, if that's something of interest to you, uh, storytelling, and also use services in libraries and information agencies. And there are general requirements for uh, these programs um, listed on that website that I have just, or web page, sorry, that I have just posted in the chat. Okay, next. Next is me. Okay, additional program information. So what is really cool? Um, okay, uh, we have a quick question about health informatics. We do have a concentration in health informatics. And um, uh, I didn't really cover it much. That's, uh, I just said that this is a, a highly ranked program, uh, well known in the country, it has a ranking number six in, in the country. And I posted the link uh, in the chat where you can explore concentrations, including the health informatics concentration. So for uh, what's good uh, about our programs also is that uh, GRE or GMAT, GMAT scores are not required for um, applying to the program. And uh, those of you who are interested uh, maybe for the future career purposes or for whatever reason in the STEM degrees, um, uh, the, the program with uh, information science major is a STEM degree. Uh, both of them, the information science masters uh, and library science masters are accredited by the American Library Association continuously uh, for many years. We have just uh, a year ago, we ran through uh, a round of accreditation, fully accredited. 
which is um, important for uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, applying for jobs after the programs because usually the employers are looking for uh, applicants who have degrees uh, library and information science degrees that are accredited by the American Library Association. Um, also, uh, we talked about the practicum a little bit uh, in relation to the school library program uh, in the Master of Science and in Information Science and in Library Science. There is a possibility to get a waiver of a practicum experience if a student has had uh, six or more uh, months of uh, paid uh, experience that is relevant, work experience that is relevant. And uh, the way we determine, of course, that that's decided by us, by academic advisor, and the way we determine it, does this experience build any of the, cover any of the core competencies that are defined by American Library Association. Uh, and uh, Dr. Shul Johns already mentioned that for the school library certification, the waivers are not available, but the practicum is done differently there too. And our degrees are awarded three times in a year in May, August, and December. So there is flexibility there, but we have only two commencement ceremonies in May and December. Oops. Okay. So uh, a relevant question, of course, is how much is all of this going to cost? And uh, we're not trying to um, you know, dodge the question, but when we were in conversation with the financial services group, they uh, suggested that we provide the calculator because there are so many possible combinations um, that are relevant to our students. So it's very difficult to you know, go through all of them or state uh, one cost that is an average, for example. So both of these uh, links will take you to uh, the appropriate place where you can fill in um, your criteria and calculate what the uh, what the associated cost will be. We also have uh, funding opportunities through the department and scholarships. Uh, once you have uh, joined the uh, degree program, we have scholarships and awards that are uh, offered continuously um, and. I think we had, uh, gosh, as many as 30 different categories. So uh, there are lots of opportunities to apply for funding and uh, as a scholarship, and you can gain um, references, recommendations through your uh, professors in your courses as well. We also have uh, a limited number of teaching assistantships and graduate library assistantships. <laughs> uh, and the GLA uh, is an opportunity to actually work in one of the uh, libraries at UNT, at the Willis Library, for example, or even out at the Discovery Park Library. So um, I actually had experience with that. Um, teaching assistance means that you are uh, assisting one of the professors and uh, that can be a number of functions. They are, however, very limited, but we do have uh, those available. Oops, going the wrong direction. There we go. Okay, so to uh, summarize, I have another slide uh, about where our graduates usually end up. So it's going to be the next one. But before that, we wanted to summarize the advantages of UNT master's program in library science or information science or academic graduate certificates. Well, UNT, first of all, is a very attractive choice for a graduate education because it is a um, tier one research university. What that means, there is a lot of research going on. So uh, that uh, makes a difference for reputation 
of the university, uh, again, uh, an advantage with uh, future employers, but also opportunities for students to get involved in the research and enrich their uh, portfolio. Um, UNT is also one of the nation's top 10 public universities on the rise. Uh, and um, we are, as uh, uh, Dr. Schultz Jones has mentioned, our um, programs are uh, financially competitive uh, cost wise. They are not too expensive, a very reasonable costs. And uh, we've posted in the chat uh, a link to uh, the tuition and fee calculators. Janine, thank you very much. You're posting it again. So um, that would allow you to make an estimate for every student. It's a different situation, but in any case, it is very competitive financially. Uh, also, uh, our Masters uh, of Science programs in library science and information science uh, are currently fully online. We used to have uh, that face-to-face com -face component, a hybrid component in the core courses, the required three courses, but it is now uh, gone. So uh, it is possible to completely uh, do all the program from the beginning to the end uh, online which is a great advantage and adds flexibility too. But if you wanted to uh, add more face-to-face -face courses to, you, to the mix, we do once we emerge after the COVID uh, um, situation, we do offer uh, a number of courses in the face-to-face -face mode as well. Uh, our degrees are accredited. We've already mentioned that. I don't know why I put it on both slides. <laughs> yeah, and the rankings. Health informatics uh, or health librarianship concentration is ranked number six in the nation. And the program as a whole, Master of Science and in Information Science or Library Science, is uh, ranked in the top 20 uh, and actually number 18 among the public university programs. So where do our graduates end up at? Well, first of all, it's not only in the United States, we have a number of international students who uh, uh, were maybe domestic students who are after the program are employed abroad in different kinds of institutions, uh, all possible kinds of libraries, academic libraries at the uh, universities, community colleges, also public libraries and rural libraries, including school libraries, definitely we have a strong, large school library program. Uh, all kinds of digital libraries, archives, institutional repositories. Uh, in business environments and corporations, uh, information centers there or special libraries in archives, of course, especially with the growth in our archival program, uh, more of our graduates are uh, starting to be uh, working in archives, museums and galleries, other cultural heritage institutions, those who are focusing on uh, are enrolled in the health information, health informatics concentration, usually then work in health information centers, for example, at hospitals or a large uh, health providers networks. Legal information centers at law firms, uh, graduates of our law librarianship uh, work at these places. And uh, of course, government agencies, uh, different organizations that work with libraries as vendors, publishers, library database development companies, and other information technology companies as well. So that's in a nutshell, but you could expect in the future. And one more option that is not listed here, we have a wonderful, very strong, very large doctoral program, information science PhD program. So those of our master students who are research oriented and want to pursue a career in academia as maybe as a professor in the future, uh, or just want to delve more into research, uh, get into the uh, PhD program after uh, completing their master's degree. So that was, uh, I believe, the brief introductions that we've prepared. And now we will be happy to address uh, the questions that you have. OK. Now, uh, oops.
steps. And of course, I, my every time I touch anything, it goes to the next slide. I apologize <laughs> every time I open the chat to see the questions. It uh, my computer is sensitive. Okay, um, I'm kind of working backwards here. Uh, are there less opportunities for mentorship for online students as opposed to now? Um, how do you mean mentorship? In in what sense are you meaning that? Is that something that perhaps San Juanita? Is that something you can clarify for me? No. Okay. Um, Time limit, very, very excellent uh, question. So how much time do you actually have to uh, complete the degree? Uh, certainly for uh, school librarians, it's five years. And um, Dr. Zavalina, do you have uh, on the information science side uh, or Kaylee or even Rachel, I think is here as well. Yep. Yeah. This is Rachel. Um, I answered this in the chat earlier, but yeah, you have five years to complete the master's program. Um, most students, if they're working full time while they go through the degree, they finish within uh, six to seven semesters um, because they're taking two courses per semester. Uh, and that's usually to have financial aid dispersed. You have to have at least two courses per semester to be eligible for aid. Um, so Six to seven semesters is the norm if you're working full time, um, but some students, if they take a break or take some time off and come back, you have five years to complete the degree. Great, thanks, Rachel. And Rachel, I should mention, is the director of uh, our wonderful advising team. And we, don't ha we haven't uh, provided the email address, so we should put that in the... Uh, and I'm doing that right now, the advising, right? CI advising, so you can always contact them and uh, make it about, thanks, Rachel, you put it in as well. Okay, great. Um, I've also uh, asked Janine to post uh, the link for, uh, there's another specific session uh, on April the 21st, that is specific to youth librarianship and school librarianship. So um, that would be another opportunity. She's posted the link where you can register if you want to take a look at uh, schools, for example. Um, Okay, so good question. Um, is it okay to submit my application and supporting documents in stages or do you prefer it all at once? Um, Kaylee, is that, yeah. Yep, either way is just totally fine. Um, I, do, I do want to state that the graduate school is going to take the longest. So it, it's better to submit them kind of closely together because once the graduate school has deferred your application to me, if I have all of your documents, I can then just process your application. So, Good. and I, I did see just another, um, another question about uh, the, um, the, Deadline. I'm so sorry. The fall deadline. Right. Uh, it's June 15th for domestic students. It is April 14th for um, international students, and that's just to allow time for processing and, and visas and I-20s. And it really uh, doesn't mean that if you don't get everything in until you know the end of June or even into July that you don't stand a chance. It just means that you can be sure that your application will be looked at uh, if it's in by the 15th of June, right? That's, that's absolutely right, I'm sorry. And I wanna apologize for all the noise prior, um, but <laughs> yes, that is, it's a priority deadline. And I think most of what you're going to find around UNT is a priority deadline. What that means is if you submit prior, 
uh, your application is guaranteed to be looked at. If you submit after, it may still be looked at, but it can also be asked to defer to the subsequent term. And don't worry, Kaylee, I'm sure everybody appreciates uh, the, the cheerful voices of a little one who has just discovered her lungs. <laughs> she, she runs the show and unfortunately <laughs> I put in a silence request and it apparently was denied. So thank you yeah. we can, we can relate. <laughs> no worries. Oh dear. Um, I have two questions about data science certificate. I just wanted to quickly say we do have a data science master's program. Uh, so instead of a certificate, uh, if you're interested in data science, it's a separate master's program in our department. Right. Yes, and I will say too, Dr. Savlin, real quick, um, they, I think they are developing a certificate for um, as well. So for maybe people who don't plan to do the entire master's, I, I think a graduate academic certificate is underway for data science too. Right, we're hoping that that is completed over the summer so that we can um, begin offering that in the, in the fall, but certainly by spring of uh, 22. And in terms, of, this is a great question about us filling up. Um, what we uh, typically do is arrange other sections and other instructors if we have um, really uh, popular courses. So we were under severe restrictions uh, because of COVID in terms of, you know, how do we handle our face-to-face -face courses because we do offer some of our courses uh, with face-to-face -face sections. Uh, so it's been, um, it's been a challenge uh, kind of keeping track of what we're able to do and when, but at the moment, uh, I can say that uh, we do have a large program, but we try to accommodate um, the number of students that are interested in taking courses. So again, that, that deadline is, uh, it's a bit squishy, but as uh, Kaylee said, you can be sure that your application will be looked at if it's in by the deadline. So Shannon had asked about the deadline and that's June the 15th, right? Not first. Kaylee, is that? Yes, yes. So uh, that is June the 15th for domestic students. Again, like I, I will work with most people as long as there is space in classes. That's kind of my only, only uh, restraint there. And then I do see that I uh, had a question from Vanessa. Um, she says, uh, in regards to the undergraduate leveling option, would those 12 hours be available online for out-of-state students? It is my understanding, and Rachel may correct me if I'm wrong, uh, those classes are only online. Um, and, and you can do them for out-of-state. Am yep. I right, Rachel? Yep, you're right. Okay, and Kaylee's asking when admitted, is there an indication of whether the program is going to be online or on campus? When you, when you look at the schedule of courses, it will tell you whether it is an online uh, course and also if it has uh, a face-to-face -face section that would be offered um, either in Denton, and we have in the past had courses offered in um, Houston as well. And if you're asking, I get, I get this question quite frequently. If you're asking, um, say what you are intending to do is to apply for the online only program or the in-person or the hybrid, they all admit the same. So you know there will be no um, indications on your admissions paperwork or anything like that saying that you have been admitted to the online program or the hybrid program. That will be something that you just determine with your advisor as you are enrolling for classes. Okay, and Ashley's saying just to make sure to become a district librarian at a public school is the best way to go master in library science with a concentration in youth librarianship and the answer is no. The best way to go is the masters in library science or information science but school library certification. You can always then if you want to uh, switch into a public library with youth librarianship, but you can't go the other way. So don't take the youth librarianship 
concentration if it's school libraries or a school district that you want to work in. Youth librarianship is for public libraries. Okay, so I'm glad you asked that question. Yeah. Okay. I did have one. Uh, Shannon did ask, can you restate what you are looking for in the statement of purpose? Statement's purpose is basically just your uh, elevator pitch about yourself. I talk about uh, goals, talk about your experiences so far, talk about what's led you to wanting to, um, to take part in this program, talk about why you think you are the best candidate for this program. It's just, it's, it's really just your, your star role um, and that you're just, I think elevator pitch is the best way to state it. Just tell me why you're passionate about the program and why you'd be great for it in 300 to 500 words. I see Justin has asked about the difference between archival studies yeah. and imaging technology concentration and the graduate academic certificate in academic uh, in archival management. So the concentrations are just uh, a track that you select when you are pursuing your master's degree. So you would have a master's degree with that flavor, with that focus on that area. The certificate is designed basically for those who maybe have completed their master's degree already or finishing it up and would not have a chance to revise completely their program, but want these additional skills and knowledge. Uh, and actually, I believe on our web, web page for the uh, certificates, it also says it could be pursued by somebody without a master's degree, uh, by somebody who has an undergraduate degree. So it's just four courses, usually graduate academic certificates are just four courses that focus on the specific areas. They don't have a course, they don't have any other course requirements, just these four. And sometimes people will, um, do both. They will do a master's degree and a graduate academic uh, certificate. Typically, uh, that would be something, uh, well, like school, <clears throat> excuse me, like school libraries to also uh, gain the uh, certificate in youth librarianship so that you exit with both. Um, but the the point about the graduate academic certificate is more the professional development for people who have already earned the master's degree as as uh, Oksana has said so um rolling Can admissions yes I wanted to answer a few of the questions from I think some international students that came in great yes um, thanks one was about face-to-face -face courses or hybrid courses. Um, we have enough face-to-face -face courses for students to meet the requirement of their F1 student visa of taking two courses on campus at least, and then one can be online. So, um, but it does depend on your area of interest or the concentration you're pursuing. I would say for the information science masters, Health informatics, the general program, and information systems are um, more in line with doing the the program with you know for an international student on an F one visa. Um, youth librarianship, not so much. Those courses are mostly all online. So um, except for the core courses. So uh, yeah, you can take courses face to face if you're an F one international student. And then um, for health informatics questions, it was also posted in the chat, um, but I think a student asked uh, who to talk to about health informatics questions. And Dr. Anna Cleveland is the faculty advisor. You can also send questions about the program to the CI Dash advising inbox and we'll, we'll assist you in getting answers. Okay. There was a question about uh, synchronous or asynchronous courses for online. That depends. It varies from course to course. Some courses are delivered. Uh, the courses I teach, for example, in information organization or area are all synchronous. We have weekly class meetings or sometimes even twice a week we have class meetings. For some other subject areas, a synchronous component is not as important. Um, there might not be synchronous meetings or be just a couple in the semester. 
Okay, and uh, for practicums, what do students actually do? Well, the idea is that you gain some work experience in the library setting that you're interested in working or information uh, science setting. So you will have some help in uh, locating a place uh, to do that, but it, typically it's going to be something related to uh, your concentration, right? With the idea that not only do you gain the work experience, but you gain valuable contacts um, through working uh, in the field. So Emily, I hope that answers that. Um, just going back through, oh, what types of things are included in the e-portfolio? Um, you do set up uh, a profile of yourself. And then as you complete coursework, you add completed assignments to the portfolio. So some of those assignments are going to uh, demonstrate um, your proficiency in uh, a variety of areas so that at the end, your ePortfolio is also a good marketing tool for you uh, in terms of showing um, potential employers. So it's always going to be um, a assignment course related material. Just I did see some questions about rolling admission um, and the programs filling up. Yes, uh, so we do have our priority deadlines and admissions is, a, is rolling. And we do admit up until the program filling up. Uh, and we will send out a notification via an email if the program does fill up. And we will ask you to defer to the following uh, term. But another thing that I do want to point out, especially if someone's considered undergraduate leveling, your application, your Apply Texas that you do at the grad school that you pay the $75 for, that is good for one year from the time that you submit it. So if you're going to do undergraduate leveling, it's a good idea to get it done in one or two terms and then immediately update for that so that we don't have to pay that extra 75. You can do that, but if you want to get around that, that is one way to do it. And if Ashley's asking about working, a, um, you know, as a library aide or assistant, um, it can count towards the practicum depending on what your duties are. So uh, what we have found in some situations is that the supervisor or the branch manager might be able to provide um, an expanded role during uh, a practicum where you're uh, asked to develop something specific for the library and that would enhance your practicum experience. So it's, it, it depends is uh, because it is specific to the situation. I hope that helps. The practicum hours, are they difficult to complete while working a full-time um, job? Uh, again, this, it's that pesky, it depends. Um, the practicum can be uh, completed by volunteering, for example, um, in a library on the weekends, or if you work on the weekends, then, you know, during the week. So there are some flexible options to uh, completing the practicum. And it doesn't have to be, you know, like within a one week period or, uh, you know, practicum can, it will extend over a semester. Okay. Anything else we've missed? Um, I think we should give some contact information here. I did just really quickly want to, uh, somebody asked about, is there any difference in applying for the Virginia, West Virginia um, cohort? There is no different application process for that. You will indicate your state um, when you are applying. And then there's a, a, a question when you are applying on your web application for information in library science to us, but there's no different application for that. 
and a, stati a statistics class as a prerequisite for, you mean for the master's uh, degree? Uh, statistics is, uh, if you're looking at data science, but um, not, not for the master's degree in general, no. We do have a, a course that is a guided elective that is more like research in library and information science. It's a more generic type of uh, research masses course. And I think the, the whole area of statistics relates to data. And although we have a data science degree, we are also integrating data literacy into our coursework because there is such a high demand for understanding, uh, interpreting, and being able to uh, even put data together to make presentations, for example. So uh, that will be uh, inclusive to the degree. And I've included my uh, email address. I'm always happy to hear from uh, people who are interested in our programs. And Kaylee has provided her email address for questions about admissions. And I did identify the CI uh, advising at unt.edu for uh, the advisors as well. Yeah, great. Thanks, Oksana. Yeah. Have we missed anything that someone was curious about? Oh, there was a question about mentorship, it looks like. Yes, but uh, she didn't clarify it because I wasn't sure what she meant. Um, she responded. Oh, I'm sorry. Where? I missed it. Just a second ago. I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, if you're a senior in high school and you live far away from, and this is Christopher, you don't have to live on campus for your, uh, for your, oh, wait a minute. Now you're a senior in high school. You're, you're, a, a, you're you want a bachelor's degree, right? <laughs> wait a minute. Um, no, I don't think you have to live on campus in your, in your first year. But it would be uh, well, what, what Dr. Charles Jones say, hey, yo, hold on. <laughs> um, yes, uh, yes, uh, unless you're commuting um, and you have a commuter agreement with the university, then you do need to live on campus your freshman year. So that oh, really? should be, huh. yeah, yeah, that would be provided to you um, by UNT admissions, and there's an orientation process. Uh, so if you have questions about that, you can contact um, the UNT admissions office or the UNT orientation office. So, um, yeah, are you are you planning to do the master's program after graduating with your bachelor's degree? Um, you can email us. We can give you more help. Um, so email us at the CI dash advising inbox. Uh, Rachel, are we affiliated with the University of Northridge in California? That's a great question. I was trying to type up a response in the chat, um, but uh, yeah, there were, there's lots of good questions coming in. So yes, we used to have um, a cohort there when we did on-site institutes um, back in the day, uh, but the, hmm. since we're no longer doing on-site institutes, then um, we are not meeting there any longer, but uh, we do have a strong alumni base in California, and we're very, you know, interested in still attending their conferences and um, definitely, you know, working with students that live in that area. Okay, good, thanks. Okay, in terms of the uh, the formal mentorship, um, if other than school librarianship, uh, I would say we do not have formal uh, assigned mentors, but we certainly operate informally as mentors to all of our students, uh, all of our instructors, professors, uh, 
are very accessible and are all interested in helping our students be successful. So um, if you are in a school library situation, then you will have a formal mentor. That's how we structure uh, practicum. Is that, oh, the, the music librarianship. Um, that would be uh, Dr. Wheeler, Dr. Maurice Wheeler. So uh, yeah, thanks Janine, you caught that. an official internship. Well, we call them practicums. And the reason we, we <laughs> internships we do have in the data science area, but um, the practicum is needed to graduate. And that may involve an internship depending on the area. Can certificates. You have to come from a formal music performance background. Um, I didn't think so, but I'm not going to answer for Dr. Wheeler. I think he's the one that that you need to have that discussion um, with. I've just been organizing the course delivery for one of the music librarianship courses um, in his program. And uh, I wanted to be able to make a distinction between people who are interested in music librarianship as uh, a general interest and those who really are uh, intent on working in that area. So uh, he would be the one who would know the specifics about that. Okay. Now, can certificates be completed with graduate and undergraduate uh, credits? I don't believe with undergraduate credits, but certainly with graduate credits. And there is a good question about the limit of certificates. How many? <laughs> that's interesting. That, that's a good one. I, yeah, <laughs> I, to the best of my knowledge, we, we don't limit you. Um, that would be that would be a shame if we did. I think that's yeah. Okay. Have we covered everything? I think we have. Looks like it. Okay. Thank you everyone for for joining us. And I hope we've provided enough contact information that if we haven't fully satisfied your questions. Um, you can reach out to, uh, to one of us and we'll make sure you get the information that you need.